I'm good. Okay, welcome everybody to our next IDM on-site live stream. I think we have uh, problems with the audio. In any case, if you have an echo and you uh, can hear everything double, it doesn't matter because we're also taping that and then we're going to upload um, the video afterwards. Um, so very sorry for the inconvenience. In any case, we are very honored and very happy that we can welcome Mihai Razvan Ungurian, who is a former prime minister, the former minister of foreign affairs and the former director of the Foreign Intelligence Service of Romania. He's currently a professor at the Faculty of History at the University of Bucharest, a professional lecturer at the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna, and the project leader of uh, Mechanisms of Modernization and the Nation State Institutionalization in Central and Eastern Europe at our very own institute, the IDM. Mihai, thank you very much for joining us. Sebastian, thank you very much for inviting me. And I look forward to a very fruitful discussion. With you, it's always a fruitful discussion, and I'm very happy that we have the opportunity, even if we have some technical limitations. But this is the new normal that we are operating in at the moment, I think. And uh, this would also be my first question to you. Um, how is the new normal for you? How does it affect your um, current uh, teaching? How does it affect uh, your project? Maybe you can tell us a bit more about um, the reality that you are facing since the outbreak of the pandemic. I had to uh, switch on online courses quite uh, soon after the um, isolation major measures were taken and the university uh, got closed. It was not a problem, neither for me nor for my uh, young fellows, students from uh, students in university. Um, I feel like um, they are all quite accustomed to um, carry on um, talking over the net. It was it was for me to adapt to their proficiency and level of expectation. Uh, currently, um, I have two um, courses, uh, two sessions of courses online per week with my MA students in Bucharest. I, all, I also meet my um, MA students uh, from the Diplomatic Academy online. Um, they, the, 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 the latter are now in the stage of drafting their academic essays, so I try to suggest them what to do here and there and how to draft the texts. Um, so basically it's fine. I mean, it's, it's a new experience, but it's nothing tragic in it. It's a bit funny because, um, well, when, when lecturing in the university, when physically lecturing in the university, um, your personal habits are somehow different. People tend to be very stiff and um, Whereas when it comes to online, you can see me, I am just sporting a shirt, no tie. And besides, the lack of um, the haircut doesn't make me feel well. <laughs> 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 uh, it's, it, it's interesting, let me put it this way. In right. the very British sense, in the very British sense of the word. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I also must say it's, it's interesting that you can adapt to new styles and formats, uh, which pushes you into a direction that probably is going to happen sooner or later anyways. Um, but now you have to speed up this, this process. Eh? Um, so in any case, we are very, uh, I would think, in a privileged position because we are able to do that. A lot of people can't do that. And a lot of people are facing uh, severe economic, but also health uh, threats. And um, this would be my next question. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how in Romania um, the, the COVID-19 has affected the population, how the healthcare system is able to cope with this? Um, and what is the, is the current state um, in the country? 
Yeah, let me just come back to your words. We should feel happy that the internet became a, 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 social, a social quality of our life, of our lives. Um, uh, prior to these endemics and pandemics, to take uh, <laughs> to take a lot of our of our liberties. So now it's it's in a way easier for us, and um, I think it's it's nothing so dramatic. In the end, uh, we see each other, we can talk to each other, and we can do a lot of things online if necessary. Now the case of Romania is not specific i would say although conclusions are far from from this very moment of um, coronavirus chronology um, in romania today we talk about roughly 10500 roughly 10500 uh, people that have been infected by the virus um, 100 to 120,000 tests have been performed till today, which is still quite low, taking into account the general number of the population, which uh, is somewhere a bit over 90 million inhabitants. Um, there are a bit more than 12,000 quarantines exercised on Romanian subjects mm -hmm. and uh, in home isolation there are 20, roughly 27,500 individuals and the, the death rate is, uh, well, some statisticians would say that it's quite low, it, uh, it's about 552 people that passed away unfortunately. So this is, this is the image of today's Romania. Mm -hmm. Now, lessons about coping with the virus are learned on a daily basis because there is no precedent authorities or average citizens could uh, have referred to. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, a bit risky to say in this very moment whether measures that have been taken by the authorities, may they be central or local, have been good or are good or would prove good in the near future. We can see some other side effects, nevertheless, of the, um, of the, uh, of the situation mostly effects at the level of, um, of social strata and in general in the population. Uh, I would stop here for this and then just briefly jump to the um, medical situation in Romania. Actually, the, the, insti uh, the, the, the institutional side of the medical situation. Romania is happy to be as far as statistics are true, um, among the first four countries in the European Union, um, when referring to the number of uh, ICU beds per 100,000 people. So after Germany, Luxembourg, Austria, Romania is on the fourth place, mm -hmm. which is which gives a, a bit of a comfort. Mm -hmm. That can be translated at the level of the entire country into a roughly 2,600 ICU beds that can be available for uh, people um, having grave symptoms of, um, uh, of infection, due to infection. Now, these statistics would not show, nevertheless, the quality of the ICU bedding, the medical quality and the, the medical, the, the professional quality of the uh, uh, medical personnel that is employed uh, in ICU wards, would not show how much of an experience the medical personnel in general would have when tackling with this kind of disease, which is extremely infectious and uh, uh, is, is, is likely to, to provide to people who have 
um, uh, a history, a personal history of, um, of medical uh, condition could, uh, could, could go into, into a very unpleasant situation, mm -hmm. into an, an unpleasant direction. Um, Nevertheless, the uh, reaction of the Ministry of Health in Romania and the reaction at the level of the government was um, quite uh, fast, and I would say, and that was in the early days of March. And um, although um, there was a lot of uh, administrative stuttering over how to do it and what should be done in the first place, things went into a sort of um, admin management uh, expectation, management expectation or magic man management plans um, soon after, which is in a way reassuring. What we don't know at this moment is the a clear figure of the number of those who have been infected by the virus at the level of the whole country. And this is, I come back to what I was saying, that the number of, of uh, tests performed on citizens is still very low. But this is not particular, it's not a particular case in when talking about Romania. It was a, somehow a general situation in EU countries where caught uh, red-handed mm -hmm. and with no possibility of uh, procuring um, tests and different um, ventilation devices, modern ventilation devices for their ICU wards in a short time span. And that was quite a shock in the, in the uh, pharma mob, general international market. The demand was very high and uh, it showed that there is a countries who are powerful and rich could uh, get hold easier to the necessary, uh, the necessary of medical uh, paraphernalia that people would, would be in a dire need for. So um, that would mean that Romania is lacking these medical equipments. And additionally to that, I was also wondering, um, and I'm not sure if, if, if you can say something um, about this, but the number of beds, as you mentioned, is not the most important factor here, but we also need to qualify personnel. And um, I know that, for instance, um, there's a lot of, of medical uh, doctors that have left Romania because there are other more powerful countries um, not only being able to purchase medical equipment, but also medical staff already before the outbreak. Um, is this something that, that also has an effect in Romania? Yeah, um, uh, let me start with the first half of the question. Uh, well, in the first couple of weeks after the pandemics reached Romania, it was a shortage of masks, a shortage of uh, ventilation devices, quite a serious shortage of uh, special isolation equipment, protection equipment, and so on and so forth. Now things are going into a better direction, although not at a faster pace. But um, maybe uh, through, the me through state mechanisms or through private endeavors, things are somehow coming to the, to the uh, would, would, would come forth to the necessity of what the, pop what the general population would do. Romania is not in, now in the case of today's Austria, where when someone enters a shop, would get a mask for free. And, uh, well, sporting it compulsorily. In Romania, people would still need to go and shop masks prior to um, uh, leave their uh, personal isolation and enter shops or... Uh, uh, go out for uh, any kind of reason. But uh, what is still uh, to be seen is that when Romania will reach the peak of the epidemics, whether the number of ICU beds 
and the number of specialized medical personnel would suffice for the situation to become easy. Now, about the medical personnel, um, since there was no experience of epidemics, of this kind of epidemics before, um, there have been cases of faulty management at the level of uh, some hospitals who were in the, front of, in the first line of accepting um, uh, COVID-ID COVID patients. There have been also cases of faulty management at the level of local sanitary and health authorities. And uh, I will go into this later on because there is also something that politicians are responsible for. Um, there has been, uh, unfortunately, I must say this, there has been quite a few people that were experienced in supporting the medical equipment, the specific medical equipment required for this kind of thing. So, and, and Romania went beyond that first necessary stage of experiencing, of learning first, what to do in such situations. Romania was directly dropped into the cauldron into a very hot cold. And this is the reason why there have been scores of doctors and medical personnel alive who have been infected. In, in, in some spots in Romania, uh, the majority of the, the medical personnel, doctors who did it in some hospitals, uh, had symptoms of the virus, of the, of the disease. Uh, now, by way of, let's say, of, 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 of general experience, and because doctors themselves, they are connected in, in large networks of um, medical specialties, um, people started um, understanding what to do and how to work with the specific, um, with the specific uh, equipment the disease requires. Uh, yes, it is a problem with the um, working force at the level of specialized doctors. Romania was for quite a lot of time a provider of a specialized working force for other countries of the European Union where the where medical specialties were better paid or career perspectives became be better. Um, there were years when Romania lost roughly 5,000 individuals who were highly trained in medical um, science and uh, practice. Um, yeah, one could feel this lack of, uh, of specialized medical personnel. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough. It's also the result of a <clears throat> long neglect um, the system, the sanitary and the medical, the health system um, uh, benefited from the political uh, leaders of Romania. Let's not forget that the medical system in Romania was underpaid in such a way that it shamed Romania among other European countries. Um, the truth is that for epidemics, no one ever had any idea that so um, an underpaid medical system, uh, a lack of medical personnel, a lack of experience, of professional experience in dealing with such cases, um, a lack, a shortage of um, uh, specific um, protection uh, staff, material, that were the, um, the factors that slowed down in the first couple of weeks uh, of March, slowed down the pace of uh, adaptation, of Romania's adaptation to the situation. And there was also something else I should add here. Although um, the pandemics uh, became obvious in the, by mid-January, January and February were um, allotted by the Romanian political class to a different thing, absolutely different thing, just like Romania had been an island lost somewhere in space. Mm -hmm. The most important issue at that 
order of the day were early elections. Hmm. And basically, uh, neither the government nor the politicians in the parliament, the majority, I would say, would have given too much of an attention to um, the, the storm looming in the very outskirts of the continent. Mm -hmm. And then it hit Ita Italy, and then it hit Spain, then Germany, and it was only after this very cold shower that Romania started taking immediate measures. Luckily, there were immediate measures that have not been uh, prolonged, prolonged to, for too much till they were put in, uh, in place. So you would say in the very beginning there was the possibility to exploit it for political gains, political capital, um, but luckily this has not been the case once it was realized that this is really something serious, potentially threatening um, the whole the whole humanity. No, I, I, I was trying to say something else. The January and February were not um, were not uh, uh, in January and February the political class was not paying attention to the pandemics, mm -hmm. but to its own political gains. Mm -hmm. Once in early March, the situation became very blackened in what concerns the immediate effects of the pandemic, of the pandemic, then political wrangling was shut down and the government started working uh, into stalling or stopping the effects for as much as possible then. I see. But January and February were lost months. Yeah. Because of this. Yeah. No, nobody, nobody, at least in this moment, I cannot say that any of the parties in Romania is trying to take, a, to, 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 to take benefit of yeah. the situation. Yeah. But parties started to realize something, that they lack experts. Mm -hmm. They lack experts and they were not prepared. And this is not only about the, the disease, it's also about other plans aiming at developing the country, the lack of experts, and if the experts are there, the lack of attention to what they can say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was uh, that was quite a sad conclusion, early conclusion to politics in Romania. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, take it from there a bit, because we've been talking about um, Romanian labor force working abroad, um, which is a uh, significant uh, part of uh, certain areas, for instance, also healthcare and taking care of the elderly, for instance, in Austria. Um, the system is depending on um, labor migrants from Romania. Um, so now, two days ago, um, there has been a, uh, a deal made, negotiated, that these um, workers can go with a train through a corridor through Hungary to reach uh, Austria. Um, I've also uh, seen that not only Germany is importing Romanian agricultural workers, um, but also Austria is going to provide flights uh, for them. Um, it's on the one hand side um, a good sign that, that there is cross-border cooperation and do we see enough of this working together amongst the countries uh, in the Danube region in, in tackling challenges that arise from this. And on the other hand side, isn't it also a bit um, ironic that the borders are closed, um, we, we are in lockdown, um, and then we have to find ways around that um, because we are so much dependent on um, importing uh, labor force um, and then we bypass these these regulations in order to keep the system running yes you can say it's ironic it it is ironic because it happens now when the lockdown is uh, enforced on the other hand let let us not forget that Romania was the most important provider of working force in Europe made in a agriculture or construction business, infrastructure business, and so on and so forth. 
for quite a decade now. Uh, and it's been Germany, it's been Austria, it's been Italy who asked for the Romanian workers to return. Um, it is, on one hand, it's, it's ironic, as you said, on the other hand, it's in a way normal, because someone has to work, to toil in the, uh, uh, in the field, and the conclusion for um, countries that were accustomed to hosting Romanian, Romanian workers, the conclusion was that there is a clear lack of local working force and the replacement should be put in motion immediately. And the replacement was to import them from their countries of origin. Basically, those workers, um, uh, by a sort of a pendulous effect, they reached Romania very soon after the uh, after the lockdown in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, in Spain, and so on and so forth. And now they're queuing to come back to return to the countries they earned their first money from. Um, the truth is that yes, if Germany or Austria could patch the lack of working force this way. It's, it's fine, we are in the European Union, so there is no, no serious impediment just to, 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 to uh, invoke um, against this uh, uh, season uh, migration. The other, the, the, the negative effect is with the working force situation in Romania. Because Romania has quite a serious lack of working force in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And in uh, uh, the so-called tertiary economy um, uh, uh, enterprises, like the tourism, hotel business, restaurant business, the lack is the, the number of uh, those who are working in agriculture, for example, or in construction business, is pretty low. And this is the reason why starting four, yes, five or four years ago, Romania started employing uh, workers asking them and then employing workers from uh, Southeastern Asia, mm -hmm. maybe from Vietnam or from China or else from, from elsewhere, because the local force migrated, had already migrated to uh, Central and Western uh, Europe. So basically, I, I came across the declaration, the public declarations of the Ministry of Agriculture who was quite serious about what would put Romania at risk in terms of, um, in terms of food security mm -hmm. this very year. On one hand is the, is the drought, which is presumably pretty high, so no rain, no rainwater and no humidity. This is what expects us for the months to come uh, throughout summer with the effects of, um, of, um, of, of, of um, putting, of endangering roughly three um, uh, million hectares of um, uh, cultivated fields, mostly wheat, and that would be a problem. On the other hand, the lack of working force. So that were, those were the two factors the minister um, quoted and conveyed to us as to make us uh, understand how difficult the situation could be. So that also means that, um, I mean, we can see that in, in, in different countries, uh, that, the, that the labor migration um, wanders more and more east. Eh? And in the Romanian case, um, that also means that uh, not only um, the climate change uh, is is uh, endangering the agriculture, but also the pandemic in the sense that the um, labor migration that comes from Southeast Asia is now also suspended um, due to the pandemic? Yes, indeed. On the other hand, we can understand and somehow we can sympathize with these people who leave their homes again right after the Easter, right after Easter, to reach the countries they've, they've left some three weeks ago, hoping they would get a good payment. Because otherwise, if they're been home, they would be 
uh, on a so-called technical unemployment scheme. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly they could not earn as much as they could earn when working in Germany, Austria, or elsewhere in the West. Right, right. So they took upon themselves the risks related to the virus and left Romania. Because mm -hmm. in Romania, they could not find the same level of payment they could um, uh, theoretically get in, uh, in Western countries. This is on one hand. On the other hand, um, uh, this season kind of, of migration uh, has taken its toll because they, the fear made them come back to Romania. And now leaving these emotions aside, they would venture into the unknown working again in the fields mm -hmm. or in infrastructural businesses uh, out, in, uh, out of the country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in a way painful and yeah. difficult. Yeah. And I sympathize with those people a lot. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Easter. So there was a bit of um, a, a fear that Easter, be it the, the um, uh, Catholic or be it the Orthodox, um, would actually um, undermine the lockdown measurements um, in the countries because people want to come together and want to um, uh, celebrate the religious holidays. Um, how has the situation been in, in Romania? Is the Orthodox Church, which is becoming a more and more important uh, player in the country, as I uh, perceive it, correct me if I'm wrong, um, how is the church uh, contributing? Um, how are they trying to uh, help in containing the virus? Or are they actually endangering these, these lockdown um, measures? Well, uh, the reaction of the Orthodox Church, of the higher instances, the higher uh, councils of the Orthodox Church, were uh, very much like uh, the first reactions of the uh, Secular authority. So there was a, in the first weeks there was a sense of of um, urgency and a frustration and frustration coming from the fact there was no there were no solutions at hand. Um, I've went to through some very um, recent um, ex, uh, polls done by uh, Romanian sociologists interested into the immediate. Uh, effects of the uh, pandemics and the level of trust in the church, in the Orthodox Church, among the Orthodox believers, uh, the level of trust in the institution is still high, mm. very much as it would have been in other times of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, peaceful existence. The level of trust into the higher ranks into the hierarchs, so to say, of the Orthodox Church is nevertheless very low. And it went into the lowest figures ever mm -hmm. today. Why? Because people started understanding that within the Orthodox Church, although the Holy Synod was quite serious by the side, on the side of the secular authorities, in the Orthodox Church, there have been some, some uh, metropolites, some other hierarchs of uh, local, uh, local high-ranking priests, um, uh, theologians, who raise their voices against the, for example, physical uh, uh, distancing measures. Mostly when uh, coming closer to Easter. Now, Easter is like Christmas, a very important feast in the, um, uh, in the Orthodox calendar. Not just of Romanians, but in general for, 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 for Christians throughout the continent. Um, the social distancing measures were imposed only well, roughly three weeks before Eastern time. Hmm. So quite close to the very to the very day as such. 
So there were not, uh, there, were, there has been no psychological time to gulp that and understand what, uh, what the reason of those social um, uh, distancing measures um, uh, are and whether these reasons would be likely to transform the rituals into something that would not look like everyday uh, everyday believing, uh, uh, everyday practice, believe, uh, practice of belief. Um, the church tried to administer the situation. It's, it's difficult, and one can understand that the brunt has been taken by the Holy Spirit. Secular authorities are in their own line of speech. They can also only say, this is what you should do, this is what you should not do. And that's where their, let's say, um, emotional responsibility ends. Whereas for the church, there's been quite a serious and a delicate matter, trying to find ways, some of them unusual, but most of them are, to keep for as much as possible a living connection between the church and the believers. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why the institution per se is still high up in, uh, uh, in, terms, of, in terms of popular trust. Um, but uh, it won't be easy for the church as a whole to go out of the pandemics untouched, untamed. Um, the church also tried to, the Orthodox Church tried to um, be active in taking measures or helping on a private or institutional basis, hospitals and doctors to cope with the, uh, with the situation. But it's always difficult to see the good deeds when tragedies are happening around. Yeah. They just you know, they, 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 they're swallowed by, by, the, by, by the tragedy. Mm -hmm. So Austria has started to um, slowly trying to reopen um, certain shops. There is also a plan now when uh, churches will be able to hold masses again. There will be um, um, a plan for when uh, children can go back to school. Um, Romania also started um, with uh, easing of the measures um, of, of the government this week for, for, for a couple of workers. Um, but the economic uh, fallout is already now visible. We see that in Austria, we see that in, in other countries. We have a huge increase in unemployment. Um, what would you say are the, are the prospects um, for Romania to recover um, from these lockdown measures? And how would you evaluate the measures that have been taken by the government? Um, they have introduced some very drastic fines, um, which have also been issued to, to some people, um, which on the one hand side uh, is understandable because we there is obviously the necessity to prevent the spread of the virus. But on the other hand side, is that also not a disproportionate measure um, and will also have a longer lasting effect um, on the population? Uh, let, me, let me put it this way. It's not, it's not on the fines, on the quantum of the fines that um, the Romanian economy would uh, try and recover in the past in the, in the forthcoming months. Um, what has been designed until now in terms of adapting the budget to the situation, it's in a way normal, has been practiced by other countries as well. Mm -hmm. So the deficit was freed from the 3% limit and therefore has been projected to a 6.7%. Which is the double, uh, and um, the Ministry of Finance is also considering leaving European funds aside. It's also considering 
hard loans, syndicalized loans, foreign loans, as to uh, try and leave the social mechanisms still um, working, like paying um, the pensions, paying uh, salaries, keeping the budgetary the budgetary sector working, and um, uh, uh, that's on the other hand, and trying to infuse some extra funds into small and medium-sized enterprises to have them to have them take off, not in a brusque way, but slowly with less economic risks. Some of the major industrial investors uh, have decided to come uh, to to open their their factories again with the due sanitary measures in place. Uh, which is good, which is good. Um, it has been up to their own um, capacity of covering the medical, uh, the medical needs, the sanitary needs to have their factories open. And uh, like, for example, the Renault, Renault started already this week uh, doing the right things. Um, what lags behind uh, are uh, the... Uh, 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 is in the agricultural sector, what I said, the uh, food production per se coming to cereals, so to wheat and everything else, corn and everything else. When it comes to um, uh, different other kind of, of, of food, like animal meat and milk, there is no shortage. So this is what we'd expect throughout the, uh, throughout the summer, to have no problems in uh, keeping food security up and uh, feeding, feeding the, uh, the citizen. Um, uh, the, uh, what takes a lot of, what has a lot of weight onto the national budget is the technical unemployment settlement. Mm. And uh, the government, for as much as I know, has already designed a plan, a staged plan, to limit or to curb down the number of technical um, unemployment cases from a million something to less and less and less. Mm. That's that's quite a serious that's a quite a serious problem because it goes hand in hand with the unemployment relief, which is again sucking onto the onto the national onto the national budget. Now, when it comes to the public debt, Romania is in a is in a good situation, I would say. So among the 27 EU countries, Romania is on the 21st place. So very low. The public debt is not very high. So there is a lot of room to go into, into either local credits, national loans, and, and, and bonds, and so on and so forth. But it's not easy when international institutions are not very happy with uh, with providing now um, credits, loans. So, although Romania is still in a position to um, credit herself with something between 15 to 20 billion euros, what would be best for Romania would be uh, the access to European funds. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, I was very happy to come across uh, Chancellor Merkel's declaration of yesterday. Um, uh, she sketched um, an idea which has been quite aired in the last time between, uh, between the heads of state and governments in the European Union, of, um, putting up a fund, a, this economic distress fund, let me put it this way, um, worth um, uh, 2,000 billion euro, which is quite an amount of money. The condition to access those money would be to have to prove that there are real reasons to get uh, to get amounts, mm -hmm. some amounts of money from. And 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 this is the only solution I could imagine in this moment. On one hand, to cover. A, an economic contraction worth, at the worst case, 15% of the industrial economy of Europe. And on the second hand, to give a sort of a content, 
and solidity to the principle of European solidarity. That's a, and then we'll see, yeah, and then we'll see whether it comes between countries who would be on the north part, in the north part of the continent, the south part of the hmm. continent. This is not important in this moment. Yeah. But the very idea that we are ready to put money into a economic distress fund, this is important. Mm -hmm. This is important, and mechanisms will follow. In any case, this fund has a good condition today to be built because the next financial exercise, budgetary exercise in the European Union is due to come out. Yeah. So in a way, in a way, both schemes would overlap. Right. And give a reason for the European Union to reconsider its 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 values and uh, ethic identity as well. Yeah. That that would have been uh, my next question. Uh, concerning the European solidarity um, and the possibilities to get out of this surely ensuing um, economic crisis on a European level. Um, now, you've partially answered uh, the question where Romania um, would potentially stand in, in the discussion of how to, to fight this on a European level. What I still would be interested in, um, not necessarily the, the Romanian perspective, but uh, your own uh, perspective, given also uh, the experience uh, that you have working on a European level with all the European um, uh, partners. When we look at the um, fight against the coronavirus, we can see that there has been a very um, separate national approach. There has not been a lot of coordination. Now the European Commission is trying to, to basically um, prepare for the aftermath um, and trying to to gain um, control and to be visible again as a, as a player but nevertheless they are dependent then also on, on what the member states in the end uh, will decide or not decide so what would you say um, because on the one hand uh, there are optimistic scenarios that say this is the the, the moment um, after Brexit, that the European Union needs to uh, regain momentum for further integration and solidarity and working together. Um, but there are also pessimistic scenarios that would say, so this is, um, if, if, if the Brexit has not been already the beginning of the end of the European Union, um, then this might lead to it because we see undermining of rule of law, we see undermining of, of uh, basic uh, liberties that the European Union stands for. And we see tendencies that countries rather would like to solve it um, on their own and be able to say, well, we found our national approach than having a, a unified European approach to solving the crisis. I, yes, I tend to be on the, um, let's say, um, on the sunny side of the, of the interpretation, not uh, overreacting uh, into optimism, but uh, somehow more serene about the matter. Yes, it is like a litmus test for the European Union. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, as you, uh, as you said, uh, countries reacted um, on a national basis. And they started, um, taking measures they uh, deem appropriate against the virus on the basis of national decision. Then two, three weeks after, most of the members of the European Union, if not all, realize that if there is no concentrated effort in a way or another, maybe on the economic side of things, like this economic distress funds or financial side, maybe on different other systems side, like health, education, then we should forget about us going out or leaving this problem out of our lives. For example, I think that if it comes to a moment of sincerity, this experience should make us understand how much of an European effort we need in terms of scientific research. Mm -hmm and how much we should 
and, and why should we consider education, maybe medical education, I don't know, uh, fundamental sciences, everything comes into the package, hmm. as, con as extremely important to the political health of and, and resistance of the European Union, per se. We have transformed the European Union into an economic powerhouse of the world. But it should be also the powerhouse of ideas and research and solutions to those problems that are either facing us or facing others and have not been given enough attention until now. Mm -hmm. When it comes to health systems, we should understand that what we need is a common approach. The national, the national basis systems or health systems are built on is not working anymore. What happened in Italy, where the rich north fell victim to the virus in a way the south didn't, proved that there is something wrong in the way we organize or we have organized and managed the national health system. And therefore, steps towards a common approach, and why not to a sort of a general EU kind of system, of health system, that would certainly imply solutions to other things as well, from insurances, from health insurance systems, to uh, the rights of, uh, 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 of workers and social, social rights, uh, European citizens in general should be taken. And this is, that would be an approach that would open the way to further integration, other than us knocking at the doors of political integration, as we did until now. Mm -hmm. Because it was also, it was very much about politics when furthering an enlargement, the enlargement of European Union. It's not about working on systems. Whereas I think that now if we are quite sincere with us and take some lessons from what we have gone through, it is about the systems that should be integrated first. And that is like furthering integration the other way around, not through knocking at the door of politics, mm -hmm. but basically coming back to the very interest of the average EU citizen. Mm -hmm. Because the average EU citizen is important, is interested into his welfare, his health, his capacity of enjoying the four liberties of the European Union, and so on and so forth. And this is where our well, the expectations of the citizens are. And this is in the end for those who are still uh, well reluctant to see the political outcomes. This is how we can stall populism and political actions. Mm -hmm. I like to share your optimistic view. I think also that, that there is a tremendous chance, um, but there is a need to, to coordinate and, and, and provide ideas um, that are probably helping um, to restart uh, a more positive move towards integration and less um, about the trends that we have seen recently of, of re-nationalization. Um, if I may, one, one last question I, I simply have to ask um, if, I, if I have this opportunity uh, to talk to you. Uh, not only the, the European Union you've mentioned enlargement, which will be um, certainly a challenge and, and must also not be forgotten, which unfortunately has happened during the last economic and financial uh, crisis. Um, I would like to, to look a bit uh, further beyond um, to uh, a neighbor of Romania and then also the, the uh, um, direct vicinity and neighborhood. How would you say um, is, is the, the chances of the cooperation within the Danube region um, for the next um, for the next couple of months, because the it is going to be clear that countries will have to will have to see how they um, manage it internally uh, within their country. Then it would also be the
the management within the European Union. Um, and we have often seen when we talk about the European neighborhood policy that, that this is, is neglected. Now, um, we have seen a change in the, in the, uh, in the security uh, situation in the last couple of years. Uh, we have seen a change, a deterioration in the, in, the, um, in the relationship between the European Union and um, the Russian Federation. So what are, what are prospects um, and dangers uh, for countries like Moldova, for countries like Ukraine, uh, because they become more vulner vulnerable uh, through this uh, situation, not only economically, uh, but also in terms of geopolitics, um, how would you evaluate this situation? Yeah, both countries are caught between uh, the European Union and the uh, Russian Federation, so to say. Although Moldova has no direct, the Republic of Moldova has no direct border with the Russian Federation, but politically, and this is mostly through the voice of uh, the president tries to ballet closer and closer to Moscow on different reasons. The truth, as I can see, is that both Kiev and Kishinev will evaluate their possibilities of political and uh, administrative management throughout this very crisis. Mm -hmm. It is also for them, a litmus test. In the case of Moldova, the lack of working force is dire. It's a small country with, uh, the population has gone smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller because of migration. And it's only about young working force migration, unfortunately. It is also a country where uh, systems like the health national system is, has been almost considered non-important by previous political schemes and, and government. In the case of Ukraine, is the political, the difficult political situation within the borders of Ukraine, which is important too. Now, steps will be somehow taken gradually. We would be looking at the moment when traveling between Bucharest and Vienna to Budapest will be free. What would happen with the outer borders of the European Union? I would expect this opening could not happen earlier. Hmm. And the European Union will try somehow and defend its outer border, mostly the eastern border, in a way that could be unfortunately, be politically interpreted. Mm -hmm. Now, for us, as members of the European Union, what Ukraine and Moldova need is a serious help. A serious help that other countries in the European Union needed when the situation was difficult in terms of the virus, uh, in terms of, a, of, a, of the disease, of the pandemic. And I think that we should be quite aware that we are not strategically in a position to leave Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova um, suffer greatly because of the situation of today. Mm. And besides, they should be taken, it should, we, we, we should be quite serious in thinking that none of those two countries should be put in a position of becoming subjects to a blackmail. I will save you, provided you give me your soul. Mm. Something like uh, a sort of a Mephistophelic yeah. arrangement. And this is the reason why leaving humanitarian, humanitarian um, uh, judgment aside, which is very important, and it's heavily important in this case, we should also think strategically. What should we do? Yes, we should help those two countries swim against the virus, against the disease, and reach the firm ground 
of general health, and then really start working with the locals in helping them build the systems. Because the systems, the health system, the health systems in both countries have been gravely, gravely neglected. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's a strategic bid. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not a joke. It's a yeah. strategic bid. Yeah. We, cannot, we cannot just close our eyes and pretend that the world ends at our eastern world, right. eastern European world. Yeah. Very quick follow-up question, since you mentioned the borders. Um, do, you, do you see prospects of uh, the Schengen Agreement returning to normalcy um, this year? And uh, what will it mean for, for Romania? Will, they, will, will the, the current effects uh, prolong uh, the possibility to join the Schengen area? You know, this reminds me of a joke. Okay. Because the moment, <laughs> because there were some people selling, uh, saying that uh, lucky Romanians, they're not members of the Schengen, uh, Schengen Agreement, so therefore there was no open border to them, <laughs> in the sense the Schengen Agreement yeah. would have uh, would have offered, uh, thus enabling the <laughs> local uh, uh, border authorities to better select who's yeah. been who could be left in and who would not be in a position to enter the country. Yeah. But certainly, this is a joke. It's a virus joke. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that the Schengen Agreement is not now... It's been already outdated. Mm. It's been first... It's been killed by members of the Schengen Agreement. Not killed in the sense that it would have been made completely useless, but maimed, kicked. And in the end, it just left its contents out. The moment when borders like between France and Germany, or like Germany, Austria, started being, starting re-exercising the, 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 the border control, then one could understand that, uh, uh, well, um, the Schengen Agreement is very much a sort of a uh, historical process that ended by the will of some of the important members of the agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if we need to keep and if we would like to keep the Schengen agreement or that case of agreement uh, working, there are two issues at least that we should consider. Certainly, it's about the liberty of movement within the European Union, and this is untouchable. But there are two, two reasons that should be taken into consideration, and those two reasons would reshape any agreement referring to the borders themselves. And it's about, again, the proficiency of national authorities to join the agreement. And what I can see, which are those two reasons, the first, is fighting against the fight against terrorism and international organized crime of any kind. And second is health cooperation, just like in the case of the pandemics. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, you close the border, that's fine. You restrict people from traveling, that's fine. But at a certain point, when the peak of the disease is over, you have to reopen the borders, whatever you do, because we depend on each other. I mean, we cannot transform ourselves into islands and make the European Union a sort of an archipelago. It's, hmm. it's impossible. It's absent. We have gone beyond this point. So we have to be pragmatic. Yes? Something that would follow the former Schengen Agreement should be put in place. Okay. But giving, giving actually different reasons to exercise authority at the level of local border management on these two very issues, which are at hand. Fighting against terrorism, fighting against international organized crime, and help in making health systems, for example, because the pandemic offered us this opportunity, function. <laughs> so we seriously need to um, reconsider certain agreements and maybe even uh, contracts on the European level to restart after um, this crisis is over. 
Is oh, that yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's quite a high time to, to think about the real reason we have borders, not, mm. not from a political point of view, but from the point of view of the resilience the European Union should provide mm. after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it is about, uh, let's, let's think about the reasons, or let's, let's recall to our mind the reasons why France and Germany started working on their borders some years ago and reinstated the border control. It was terrorism. It was illegal migration, nevertheless, mostly. And the problem is not with the internal border. The problem is, is with the external borders of the European Union when it comes to uh, 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 migration waves. Hmm. It's not about the border between Austria and Hungary or between Hungary and Serbia. It's about the outer border. Yeah. Let's th seriously think that the outer border is far more important and consistent with our, with our strategic goals than the internal borders, mm -hmm. who should be very much a sort of a police business and less of anything else. Mihai, thank you so much. Um, this has been our longest live stream by far at the moment, I think. Um, but it has been so interesting to listen to you. Um, there's a lot of things that I take from this. I think our viewers um, that have been with us uh, will also be um, very glad for all the insights that you gave. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to um, continue working on certain aspects that we have discussed, because I think that it is also the task of institutes like IDM um, to provide um, scenarios and to think about uh, possibilities um, for after um, the corona time. I've already seen uh, that people refer to um, the time before Corona, uh, uh, to the BC times, um, and uh, hopefully <laughs> we will we will um, come to an after Corona time. Although I'm afraid that it will take some years, um, but we should prepare um, for for a real reform and how we can actually foster um, the regional cooperation, um, not only within the European Union. And look beyond our borders, as you have mentioned, uh, in the end. I could not. I could not say it better. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for this online meeting of ours. Um, I would like to convey yourself, yourself, and to our colleagues in the institute, and to all those who have taken the pain of watching us, <laughs> um, to uh, keep themselves healthy and optimistic. Things will change into better. I think so too. I'm looking forward when we can do this personally uh, again, when we can return uh, to IDM. Um, and uh, we will continue in the meantime with these live streams. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our channel, uh, go to our website, like us on Facebook, um, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, see you next time. Thank you very much again, Mihai. Um, Thank you.